I'm Laura Stetson. I'm with MIG. I'm a principal in our office and um, glad to have you all here this evening. We have a pretty full agenda. We've got a quite, a, quite a few folks who have signed on. And so we want to make sure that we're respectful of your time and get through the materials and finish up uh, probably be before eight, but we've set a, a, a two-hour time frame on the, uh, the meeting this evening. The overarching goal of this process tonight is to get your feedback on what makes great residential and mixed use design in San Carlos. Not you know throughout the Bay Area, but what is unique to your community and what do you want to see? What can be built into design standards that will ensure quality outcomes and quality development in your community? Um, Andrea said that these are called objective design standards. We might call them ODS, we might call them ODS. It's all the same thing. So bear with us if we, we call them different things this evening. We're going to go through a presentation and uh, describe to you uh, the, uh, what objective design standards or ODS are, and then have periods for interaction as well as some open-ended Q&A at the, at the end of the meeting this evening. Next slide. After two and a half years, you've probably all become Zoom experts, but just for a quick reminder on what the buttons mean, please keep yourself mute. Um, and, and actually, I don't think it will be able to, to hear you unless we, we um, unmute you, but do keep you on, yourself on mute until it, your time comes to speak. If you could put your name um, next to your, your picture or your, your black screen, that would be great because then we can call on you more easily and know, know who's with us this evening. Well, as we're making the presentation, you will be able to type chat comments into the chat box. They will only be viewed by the panelists, city staff, and the consultant team. But if you have a question, we'll be, make sure to put those, take those down, and we'll be posting those on what you will see as a what we call our mural board this evening. And that'll give us uh, time to respond and, and remember that we need to um, respond to everybody's questions and comments. And it'll be probably be easiest if everybody raises his or her hand when, when you like to speak this evening. Next slide. A couple of uh, virtual participation principles that we're all familiar with about respecting each other's opinions. There are no right or wrong answers when it comes to design, just opinions. And so be respectful of what folks have to say. We'll not be able to respond to everything this evening, but certainly we'll get your name down and follow up. And Andrea had mentioned there's a website uh, down at the bottom there, or also a, a uh, um, email address that you could reach out to if you if you um, feel like we haven't completely answered the question this evening. And uh, remember, this is just part of a longer process. We have had one meeting. There's going to be, there will be other meetings in this process for the objective design standards, as well as, as some several other planning initiatives that the city has underway, which we'll touch on in just a second. Next slide. Let's start with finding out a little bit about who's with us this evening. So Rishi, I'm gonna turn it over to you to launch the first question about which um, describes your connections to San Carlos. And just go ahead and click those on the poll and we'll see if, uh, as, as the responses come in, we've got a lot of, a lot of property owners here this evening, um, but mostly residents. So that's great. You care, care a lot about your community. We've got a couple of developers as well. Um, we've got 14 total people absent, staff and the consultant team. And so, Rishi, we are getting everybody 15 out of 19, 15 out of 15 answered. And so, Rishi, why don't you go ahead and close the poll and let folks know what the answer is. Rishi, is that something you want me to do? or? Uh no, I think, I mean, the answers are right in front of. Oh, everyone. they are, okay, yeah. <laughs> just so everybody can see. So you can all see that we've got almost 70% of you here this evening are residents. The, the next question is, what neighborhood do you live in? And so we've got a neighborhood map indicated and, and that helps us understand if folks are coming from um, up in the hillside areas or more in the flatlands or on the east side of 101. And if you don't know the name of your neighborhood that you live in, we've got a handy map to, to show that to you. And if you don't live in a neighborhood uh, because you are a developer or you're a property owner but don't live here, that's okay. You can, can sit this question out. And we've got a pretty good mix of people from across the community this evening. Um, so as you can see, we've a uh, good mix. And so 
Um, we like that. That means that uh, your responsibility is to be an ambassador and take, take this information back to your neighborhood. Uh, so you didn't know you were gonna be given a, a homework assignment when you came this evening. Okay, Rishi, how about the, the last question? Let's see how long folks have lived in San Carlos if you've lived here. And we're starting to see a lot of long-term residents. Few, few people who are just moved in, happy to be here, call, call San Carlos home. And mostly folks have been here five, five plus years in, in the community. So you've got a lot of good history that you'll be able to share with us evening, this evening. And you've probably seen how the community has changed um, during your, your tenure as a either a uh, renter or an owner in San Carlos. All right, so thanks for, for participating in the poll. Let's go to the next slide, Rishi. Let's start with an overview of, um, hold on just a sec here, I wanna get rid of the slide there. The, the project goals, as we've said, the, the primary goal for the objective design standards is to create new design standards for residential development. And that's important to keep that distinction. And I, it, uh, I, I know they start to blur about what's a development standard, something like height or setback um, versus a design standard, which starts to ask questions about materials and roof forms and building articulation. So they're, they're different things. And, and please, if we're not being clear this evening, um, call us on it and say, oh, Laura, Rishi, or Andrea, is that a design or a development standard? Are they starting to blend with each other? Uh, the, the reason um, that we are also putting together objective design standards is because there are state laws, which we'll briefly go over, that indicate that these are required by law, to, that every community does have to adopt objective design standards. Uh, the key goal, as we've said, is to learn from you and other stake, uh, stakeholders in the community this evening so that we can understand what the priorities are and the sensibilities for, for really quality multifamily and mixed use residential design in your community. Next slide. We are at about uh, maybe a third of the way through the process at this point. Um, we, we have done background research. We had our meeting back in May to discuss single family regulations. We are now at this point where we're talking about multifamily. There will be a community survey that's coming out in, in mid-November to uh, engage folks who were not, not able to come this evening and to have a, a broader net, if you will, to ask questions for that. The goal is to complete these standards by July of next year. Um, in, in about three or four months time, there will be an administrative draft that city staff will review, but the, the complete draft for public review will come out in about March of next year. So there'll be lots of time between March and um, June or July before we, we go through a public hearing process because these are parts of your zoning code. And so both your planning commission and your city council will need to weigh in and have public hearings before these standards are adopted and become uh, the rules for everybody. Next slide. Um, back in May, we did a very similar exercise. We had about 45 people attend the workshop and we took really good notes. There's a summary that is on the city's website. We took both handwritten notes as well as sketched out some of the comments that were coming in on, on a mural board. You'll see some, uh, we'll, we'll use that again this evening, but we would encourage you if you're, you're really interested in this topic to go back and look at the comments that came on, um, that came forward with regard to single family stand, uh, or detached units in San Carlos. Next slide. Uh, there are concurrent planning and um, other programs that are moving forward at this time that are related to the objective design standards. Probably the key, which many folks have been following, are updates to what's called the housing element, the city's eight-year housing plan. And it tied to the housing element are zoning code amendments that implement the housing element. There was a meeting just this past Monday evening on those zoning code amendments. Um, that this is a process that is, is aiming to be completed by um, early 2023. Uh, it's, it's a process that does require some input from a state uh, agency, the State Department of Housing and Community Development. So that is continuing to occur right now. So those, I'll, I would call that a shorter term project. The objective design standards will follow after the zoning code amendments, but there are also two other planning projects that are ongoing right now that will in some manner deal with objective design standards for very specific areas. 
uh, both in the northeast area and downtown. Um, downtown has a projected completion date of March 2024, and then the northeast area would, would follow up in uh, late, later in 2024. So those are longer range planning processes, but we encourage you to follow those as well. Next slide. All right, so before we talk about um, you know, the different components of design, we wanna set the framework for what are objective design standards or ODS or odds. Uh, I, I mentioned as I, in, in the introduction that they are, these aren't your typical zoning standard. It's not building height, it's not setbacks, it's not how many parking spaces, it's not how many trees you have to put in your yard or how much of your front yard has to be landscaped but it deals with the design aspect of a development, the um, materials that are used, the relationship of the building to the front lot line. Are there balconies? Are there porches? Are there things that bring people to uh, out into the, the what's called the public realm area? And uh, you're gonna scratch your head probably and think, well, are these things that can be quantified and measured? Well, yes, the objective design standards are do need to be quantifiable and measurable. And the goal is to create a little bit more certainty in the development process, both for neighbors, as well as those who are processing applications. And that would help streamline the approval for all types of residential development, with a key goal being to increase housing production. Um, and this is throughout California. I don't think it's a surprise to anyone that there, there is a significant housing shortage. And so the legislature has passed a number of laws, next slide, Rishi, that is really aimed, at, well, hold on, in just a minute, I'll tell you about the laws, but the objective design standards, just to, to clarify, um, this example shows something that would be a, you know subjective. It, it, it says that these buildings mean don't need to be overly busy. I'm not sure what overly busy means. Um, there needs to be proportion, spacing, pattern, but that could mean a lot of different things to different people. So the objective standards starts to measure things. It starts to say, these are the types of um, measurements that we're looking for. And it might be precise measurements, or it might say, here are 10 things that you can do to articulate the facade of a building. Choose four to five of them. And so it might not dictate how that building has to, to move in and out relative to the facade plane, but it, it gives a architect and a designer a choice of how to achieve what that objective is. Next slide. I mentioned that the, the, these um, requirements for ODS are being driven by laws that uh, have been passed down from, from Sacramento starting in um, now, really 1921, there was a large package of bills that were aimed at producing additional housing and streamlining the approval processes for housing development. Next slide, Rishi. And th this has been augmented by new laws that the governor signed just back in September that addresses the allowance for residential development in commercial zones and in communities where it may not be currently permitted. Um, also indicating that there are restrictions on uh, parking requirements near transit stations. And so uh, the, the thought there is that if uh, a project provides less parking, it, it means that there's more capacity within that building envelope to create additional housing units with the presumption that people who are living near transit might not need cars. They might actually take the train or the bus or, or ride their bike to work. Next. So where will these objective design standards apply to? Pretty much anything that has a residential uh, feel to it. And so that's why the city is uh, preparing ODS for single family, multifamily and mixed use uh, zones where residential is allowed. And the next slide shows, tonight we're focused on those areas where zoning is for multifamily housing, apartments, condominiums, townhomes, as well as mixed use buildings, some combination of, of higher density housing with perhaps a ground floor commercial component on it. So that this map shows you that there are a couple of areas up in the hillside uh, that are zoned for multifamily housing. And then certainly along um, El Camino Real and, and streets in downtown. Next. Something else that comes with the objective design standards is a new process for reviewing projects. Today, if a development project comes in, 
The developer, the applicant submits a project. It's reviewed by planning staff. Does it meet the city's general plan? Does it meet the zoning code? Um, does it meet uh, design requirements that are in the code today? And does it meet any other design requirements? Um, it's reviewed by either a review committee, residential design review committee, or the planning commission, depending on the type of project. And so there's a public hearing process where there is discretion applied to a project before something that before the project is approved or sent back for review um, or, or, or modifications. What the ODS uh, introduces is a streamlined process whereby because the standards are clear, the public understands what they say, the developers understand what they say, city staff understands what they say, it's much easier to review a project to, in, to see whether or not it complies with the objective design standards. And so it would move more quickly through the approval process, either at a staff level or at a, uh, you know, maybe still at the planning commission level, but the planning commission and or review committee would have um, really not much discretion to change things. If it meets the ODS, it would be approved. Now, um, th there would still be reserved a, a process, presumably, that if somebody elects not to comply with the objective design, design standards, they want to color outside the lines, if you will, that they could still be subject to the discretionary review process. But if they want certainty and if they want to move along more quickly, um, that they would choose this track with the objective design standards that would be available uh, for them to use. Next. So um, let's talk about what are the overarching elements of neighborhoods in your community. And Rishi, do you want me to go to the mural board here? And uh, no, not at this point. I'm going to uh, talk about okay. the overarching gift. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Uh, all right. So for, for us to develop the objective design standards, it is first important to understand from the community what those values are or, or the elements are that are critical in shaping the communities. We would like to understand the overarching elements that define the different neighborhoods in San Carlos. There are different neighborhoods in the city of San Carlos. We, we saw that in the poll. And they are some of them are defined by very clear elements, such as natural elements like topography. Uh, some of them are on the hill. Some of them are, are on the flatlands. The history, uh, the time of development that happened, uh, access to downtowns, proximity to the Bay Area, and the list goes on and on. And there could also be individual elements that resonate with individual neighborhoods. Some of these elements are captured in the past studies that we have learned so far from our existing conditions analysis or from our past, from our concurrent planning efforts, we are reviewing them and we are understanding and we want to build on all of these studies that have happened so far. So here are some of the emerging overarching elements and common themes and in today's workshop, we're going to share some of the ideas with you and we would want to learn more from you on these overarching elements. One of the common overarching element includes being safe and welcoming. Well connected to the to different community destinations is another overarching element, whether we use cars or transit or we bike or or we walk to different destinations, we want them to be well connected. Family friendly neighborhood character so our families can grow and prosper. Uh, diversity reflected not just in people who live in the neighborhood, but also through architectural designs and styles. Uh, or the physical elements like views, uh, whether you live closer to the bay to see the hills, uh, or uh, whether you live uh, in the in the flat in in the hills and you have the views of the of the bay. And then the most important element that helps make great neighborhood are people. We would. This is, the, this is an opportunity where we would like to learn more from you. What are these overarching elements or themes or values that are critical in shaping the neighborhood? With that, I'm not gonna pass it to Laura. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen so Laura can pull up the mural board. I can only do three things at a time. 
<laughs> All right. So the first question that we have is, um, we, we want, uh, you know, what what do you see as the overarching elements that contribute to San Carlos's neighborhoods? And we can have you raise your hand or put comments in the chat. And both Rishi and, and CJ are going to be uh, putting into this mural board what those over, overarching elements of the neighborhoods are. So go ahead and start typing. And uh, and if you have a question, um, I'll, uh, as, as you're typing, Rishi, I'll go ahead and, and see um, what folks are asking. Debbie, you had your hand up for a second there. Go ahead and unmute. Thank you. How will the protection of riparian corridors and creeks fit into this discussion? Because we're concerned about the light generated from the back of the buildings into areas where uh, birds nest and nighttime wildlife. So under what category would we speak to setbacks from the creek and protections for the riparian corridor in terms of like passive use? Like if something's built on a creek, you wouldn't want to put public, uh, you know, the common space back there because it would allow too much disturbance of habitat. So where would we comment about that? Um, Debbie, from what you're saying, it, and I think we've turned it into the form of something that's important to the character of the neighborhoods, it's the creek protection um, and not just the, you know, the, the water aspect of it, but uh, the, any critters that are using that creek and ensuring that you you're, have adequate setbacks and that there's not light that's uh, um, Im impacting that creek area. So we're going to take that down as a form of a comment right now at, of the things that contribute to the character of the neighborhood. But we will also, uh, CJ or Rishi, if you could put that into the questions too, so that we can respond to that when we get to the question. So what we'd like right now is just kind of a rapid fire, uh, putting forward what are those elements that contribute to the character of, of San Carlos's neighborhoods. And, and thank you, Debbie. We, we will get to that. To, to, to the responses to questions and when we get into the more detail. Um, other folks, and, and um, Andrea, I might ask you to help facilitate here just if folks have their hands up because I can't see everybody with the my screen being shared right now. Do we have other hands up? And Debbie, if you could put your hand down, that would be great. Or I could I could do that for you. There we go. Other questions, uh, things that we're, we're putting on overarching elements? Scott Marsters, yes, please. So I put it in the chat, but um, I understand Debbie's concerned about protecting creeks and, and, um, uh, and wildlife. Um, I'm more concerned about protecting um, the people who live in single family homes. Um, from uh, excessive development around their homes. So, so uh, what you're saying, Scott, is that uh, the things that make the character unique in the single family neighborhoods is the scale of the it's neighborhoods. The, the scale. And so how do you, if you're going to put development somewhere near a single family home, how do you um, make that development um, fit in with what's there already, rather than overwhelm everything that is, rather than it becoming an overwhelming building and destroy the character of the neighborhood. Good. And Scott, I'll, I'm going to give you a, a short answer to that because I think we'll have some exhibits that that illustrate that. Um, that there are a couple of techniques that are used, some of which are in your zoning code today, where a building is required to be set back a certain distance or actually um, as, as it gets taller, it has to step back, but we'll show you those in just a sec. So we, we hear that you, protecting um, the, the character of the single family homes and the scale is what's important to you. That's a character defining element. So um, Mark B, you've got your hand up. Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah, perfect. Yeah, great. Uh, I like the themes you have. I want to add sort of a category of things around climate ready design, uh, meaning more hot days, more fire danger, uh, and therefore 
if design things that fall out of that, like not having eucalyptus trees that burn down, um, having drought ready uh, landscape that includes lots of shade because we're gonna have a lot more, more hot days. Um, things like bicycle ability, uh, having e-bike infrastructure so people in multi-unit uh, dwellings can charge their bicycles easily so um, and park their bikes safely as they would a car. So there's a whole set of things that fall into that climate ready um, uh, kind of a category that, that that um, should be in design standards. Great, thanks, Mark. And it sounds like you you uh, you mean that to apply to um, pretty much any residential type of development. It it does. The gap is most noticeable where you've got uh, rental apartments or you've got townhouses and higher density high rise buildings where there's no place to park a bicycle to even today, and no place to charge an electric vehicle of any kind, whether it's a car or a bike or a scooter. Um, and as those things become more expensive, like a car, they need to be parked safely where you can lock them and preferably inside of a room, for example. Um, but yeah, all, the, all the, the shade and the hotter days and, and uh, per things like permeable sidewalks to capture the little rain that we're getting. There's a bunch of things that are gonna change, already are changing about our climate and, and especially higher density uh, housing, but you're right, everything needs to, to have those design elements included. And I just didn't see that as an overarching sort of a theme. Great, thank you. We have uh, Patty Marsters with her hand up. Patty. Hi, thank you. You're coming um, through loud and clear. Feedback. So something that came up when the transit village was being built was the idea that those buildings would reflect the noise of the train. And we were told that, okay, electrification means that the train's gonna make less noise, but now we're being really threatened, I feel, with tall buildings like on the next block, next to single family homes. And those buildings will reflect the noise of the helicopters and airplanes that go by our house. I was standing next to a, a three-story building waiting for my doctors to let me in and a helicopter went by and it was very loud only and reflected by that, by that tall building. Okay, and I was looking one way towards where the noise was coming at me from the building. The, the actual helicopter was behind me though. And that doesn't come up a lot, that we're gonna get more noise because of the taller buildings. And those buildings already, you can walk downtown and it's nice, you turn the corner and you're in a wind tunnel. And I don't think the city actually, I don't think any of these design things take that into account. And my last thing is my neighbor just said he was told what kind of architecture he could have so that would fit in with the neighborhood. So that was one thing, but he was also told what kind of paint he could use. And I wonder if the new odds are going to include telling people what kind of paint they can use, what color, how do you get objective about that? It just seems like a lot of fuss that some people have over other people's choices. Thank you. And thank you, Patty. You've got a, a lot packed in there, but I, I think one of the key things that uh, to kind of turn, turn that around about, you know, what what's, contributes to, to San Carlos is it, it's, it's quietness and the concern that taller buildings will or, or, or could increase noise problems in the community. With regard to the, the architecture and color, we'll get to that in just a little bit, but um, it is extraordinarily difficult, in fact, nearly impossible to regulate color through objective design standards. And I've only seen one or two communities that have done it and believe it or not, what they actually do is, is uh, you know, pr print the, the Sherwin-Williams paint number <laughs> that, that works. And um, uh, sounds like that's what, what you like about San Carlos is, is a little bit more flexibility and, and the creativity that, that folks might be able to have and uh, the elect eclecticism that a neighborhood might have rather than a, a dictative style and color. 
Um, let's see, Scott Marsters has his hand up again. Okay, I'm going to um, build off of what Mark said before about um, the the climate um, issues that, that we face. And one of the things that has always bothered me about um, development recently is that there's these huge parking lots um, that are supposed to be landscaped with trees. And what needs to happen on those parking lots is either we need to have some sort of development standard that says 50% of that parking lot needs to be covered within five years by trees so that it's shaded, or you can cover your parking lot with uh, solar panels up on, on top. And I've recently seen this at a, 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 a several businesses that have actually done this where their parking lots are completely shaded because on Ikea, on top of uh, the parking lot, is all solar panels. And that solves the issue of um, providing electricity for the electric vehicles that are underneath. And it um, doesn't create the heat island effect, which really happens every time you, you create a big open flat um, black surface. So I'd like to see some sort of standards around any type of parking um, that is um, for a, a multifamily uh, mixed use development. Good, thank you, Scott. And and um, in, in terms of the comments that are coming in, very open-ended. If, if we don't wanna talk about, you know, the, just those overarching elements, if you wanna talk about things that you'd like to see moving forward or those things that appear to be problematic now, that this is great because it'll help us uh, really understand what the community's concerns are and start to craft objective design standards that address them. Uh, uh, Tim. Nora, David, David Crabb has some interesting things to say in the chat. Oh, uh, okay, go, go ahead. And then we'll take Tim after you've, uh, you want to read what's in the chat, Rishi? It, and it looks like you've posted some of them. Uh, I did have posted it, but I wanted to invite David if he wants to add more to it or say something. Mm -hmm. David, would you like to come on before we go to Tim? He, he may be and shy. Can I, I just unmute myself? Oh, there you are, David. Yes. yes. Perfect. Okay. Uh, what's what's the question, Tim? Uh, the question is, did you want to expand any more on, on what you've put in the chat just to give a, 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 a okay, summary? Well, okay, or, or I got a couple of it. things in there. I said, include street trees and green open spaces and include more green local parks. We're looking at all this high density we're going to be adding to San Carlos. And we need to have some green open space. We need street trees and trees, especially, to uh, number one, uh, help reduce the physical scale of tall buildings, and number two, shade our sidewalks and our streets, and three, uh, give us some breathing room. And so, uh, and unfortunately, San Carlos is really short on little local parks, and, uh, and in some places, not even street trees. Uh, so that's one issue. Uh, the second one was uh, include most more slow in quotes and safe streets in residential and local commercial neighborhoods, uh, like the you know what we've done downtown and in uh, some areas, uh, so that uh, we don't have a lot of through traffic, and that uh, people have an opportunity to do that. And I was just starting to type a third one, which is that. Uh, the, all the new buildings we're building, especially these big, huge, humongous ones that are supposedly in the uh, pipeline, uh, they should be looked at for not shading the adjacent properties for any long period of time during the day for number one, uh, protecting people's uh, uh, access to sunlight, and number two, protecting people's access to sunlight for solar panels. And so uh, if we're building a whole bunch of nine story buildings somewhere and they're shading a lot of properties, no one can put the solar panels on their roofs and that kind of negates the idea of people having individual solar on their roofs. So those are three uh, issues I've thought of at the moment. Great, Thank thanks, David. We've got Tim 
uh, with, with his hand up. So Tim, thanks for your patience. Go ahead. Hi. Uh, yeah. Thanks for, uh, thanks for having me on. Um, and thanks for having this meeting. Um, so as far as the design standards, I, I, I think one important thing kind of piggy, piggyback on what David was just saying, um, having smaller parks, pocket parks, um, as far as design standards going, you know, and I understand this is for like buildings and things like that, but, but also we, we do need that space. We need the space with some trees, some, some smaller parks, some benches. Um, I, I, I really want to go on record with that. The other thing um, I want to talk about is, is um, just the fact that uh, not as much the city council, but, but definitely the planning commission, um, my concern is them actually following the standards. For example, for 405 Industrial, which is a proposed biotech building, six, six stories high, at their last meeting, to, or not their last meeting, but in the meeting that they had to approve uh, the proposal on that, dozens of people spoke out about it being way too close to the neighborhoods, about it being six stories high and just towering over our neighborhoods. And, and you know, the, the planning commission basically completely ignored everything and with very little discussion approved the proposal as is. So uh, that, that area has a 50 foot variance. They approved almost 50% more, like 90 or 95 feet. So how are we going to make sure that these design standards that we come up with are, are that, that, that they're held to, to, to what we have because we have things like variances and setbacks and all that, but that all disappears when we have a planning commission like what we have right now. So that's my main concern is that, you know, even if we go through all this nomenclature and all this planning, that, that when it comes down to the push and shove and the, the city council and the, and the planning commission are just gonna throw this stuff out the window. With the 50 foot variance, they should not be going 100% more with that. That's just not acceptable. So again, I understand having design standards and, and um, zoning and, and all those things, but how do we keep accountable our planning commission and our city council for that? Thank you very much. Thank, thank you, Tim. And Mark, you had a chance to speak uh, already. So if you, if I could go to Amy and then I'll come back to you, if that's all right. Amy? Okay, can you hear me? Perfect. Did, work? Did this right? Okay. To kind of uh, piggyback on some of the things that have been mentioned in particular, what David said about the more parks. You know, we moved here for a family friendly city and we left San Francisco and came here because um, it's safe for our children. They could walk around and feel safe and there's sidewalks and they could bike. And, um, you know, the park issue is becoming more and more problematic. Our kids, we're having a hard time finding game space for soccer games and to go out and play. And that's a real concern because I don't think that is being um, implemented in the whole overall design when uh, they're coming to this, the planning commission for these large projects. And they're not saving space for parks, which is unfortunate in my opinion. You know, and um, to kind of also piggyback on the last um, comments with what Tim said, you know, the planning commission spent two hours or more discussing one house on Carmelita and didn't, has denied it about three times because of where the air conditioning was, because of the design of the house close to the other houses. And yet when large projects come forward, it's just sort of a rubber stamping without taking into consideration the neighborhood and how that's gonna impact the traffic. So the safety of our children, you know, the parking issue that it raises, no one is going to say um, we shouldn't be having high density. That's not the issue. It needs to be in the appropriate place and it needs to be thoughtfully designed. Like San Francisco, they rubber stamped a bunch of stuff during the 70s and 80s and those are ugly as sin, those buildings. And now I'm sure a lot of people go back and go, oh, we shouldn't have built that, that is ugly. So, you know, I think um, it'd be nice that there'd be more consideration of tying design in with the neighborhood so it's not sticking out like a sore thumb. Great. Thanks, Amy. And you mentioned a lot of good reasons to move to San Carlos. So 
Th thank you for participating tonight. Let's see, I think Mark is the only person with hand up right now. So Mark, go ahead. Yeah, briefly, I, there's two climate specific things I wanna call out that haven't, haven't popped up on the board. One is the uh, bike and e-bike infrastructure that's specifically getting around parking, the um, kind of appealing nature of using bikes in town needs uh, design standards and attention. Um, the second thing is reflectivity. <clears throat> when you have a lot more hot days and you have a lot more high rise uh, buildings as people have discussed, you get pockets of, of hot, hot urban environment um, there's a name for that I'm, I'm forgetting right now, but reflectivity is the notion that you have things like roof gardens, that you use hues of paint on roofs that is lighter so it reflects instead of absorbs and creates uh, urban heat pockets. You are careful about asphalt. Uh, if you have to have it, you make sure it's shaded with trees on hot days, things like that. But reflectivity is a, an objective standard that's going to become essential as we have more 100, 110, 120 degree days here. Thanks, Mark. Those are very, very thoughtful comments. I appreciate everybody, um, you know, really knowing your community well and, and having a good grounding in in, in uh, what what affects the the environment that you live in. Um, Rishi, I think maybe what we'll do is we'll take a little breather here because everybody's going to have an opportunity again to weigh in. So why don't we talk about the emerging design elements of neighborhoods? And I'll ask you to go back and share your screen with the presentation. Sure. Uh, can you see my screen back? Mm -hmm. okay. You're there. Uh, all right. Uh, so thanks, Laura. Uh, so now let's move on to the individual physical design elements of neighborhoods that reflect the overarching values and themes that we just discussed. And I know some of us brought up good individual com uh, conversations about like windows, climate sensitive design. Those are all very good uh, discussion topics. And we have some uh, design elements that we have brought up for further discussion. So starting with uh, walking and biking and driving around these neighborhoods, we, we, have, uh, we began to see certain common physical elements that are helping create a nice neighborhood feel. Uh, the first element we saw was the ground floor interface. Like in multifamily units, there were setbacks that allow for ground floor units to have their private entrances to the building. We also saw these setbacks designed with, with a landscape buffer that provides shade and comfort, and, th and that's throughout the day, but also acts as a buffer from the moving traffic. And in the case of mixed use development, we saw ground floor businesses interact with the street how the entrances are placed uh, and, and, and defined are some examples uh, to show in this graphic. We also saw beautiful trees in the front setbacks. For ground floor units, we, we like to have our op own open space in, in front of our homes that also provides some kind of a privacy from the public facing street. And the location, articulation of front yards and the relationship of the building to the adjoining street are some of the key parts of ODS that helps strengthen the existing San Carlos neighborhoods. Moving to uh, entrances and balconies, similarly, we, we uh, how the building looks like as it fronts onto the street, be it through entrances or balconies, can really help strengthen the character. And it also helps break the overall massing of the building and blend uh, well with the adjoining developments. Common open spaces are another element that contribute to the health of the community. The building design can help create desirable open spaces that in turn can create privacy and transition to adjoining development buildings. The overall shape and size of the, size of the building is another key design element that helps strengthen the existing neighborhoods of San Carlos. The ODS can provide direction on how to use various building design elements, such as roofs, silhouettes, and how upper floors step back to, to help allow break the overall mass of the building. They, they all complement, uh, they, they are also, they also complement the adjoining buildings, be it single family or multifamily, if designed accordingly. These standards help define the height of the building, sloping roofs that in turn add character to the neighborhoods of San Carlos. Respecting the adjoining development is another key aspect. 
stepping down the massing of the building so our neighbors don't feel trapped or surrounded. Designing the building with step back helps maintain the light and it allows, it does not allow overshadowing and also maintains vent ventilation. Similarly, materials, we talked, some of us, we talked about the colors, materials and colors can help strengthen the existing character, varying paint colors, varying materials and, and textures add a lot of value and character to the neighborhoods. All of these big design elements with regards to site layout, uh, massing, materials and colors, landscaping and open spaces help engage the eyes, which is critical to help strengthen the overall neighborhood character. So here are the elements that we talked about today. Street interface, whether it is a multifamily or a mixed use development, front setbacks with landscaping, entrances and balconies, common open spaces, building shape, size and articulation, transition to adjoining developments, materials and colors, and details that overall engage the eyes. And there could be more elements. And, and today we would like to hear from you about these different elements that help contribute to San Carlos neighborhood. With that, hey, Rishi, um, yes. Yeah, Rishi, could you go back for a second, uh, just to, to the prior slide, is just to give folks a, a minute to to look these over and make maybe jot down some notes because we're going to be using these as the topic areas for our interactive discussion. And we're certainly not limited to, to any of these particular topics, but if you just start to absorb these things that make good design and that will be built into the objective design standards um, so that we can start to ask you questions about specific pieces of these. And I know you've, you've, you've touched on some of them on your, your comments already, but this is the time where we're gonna get into the, the nitty gritty about open space and materials and colors and um, entrances, balconies, and, and these types of things. So Rishi, think now. Sorry, sorry to sure. interrupt you there. No, no worries. Uh, I think we are at the right moment where I can uh, sit, we can switch the screens again. Uh, and, and ask the community, what are those different design elements that are important to uh, maintain or, or uh, improve the uh, neighborhood, the character of and the neighborhood characters in San Carlos? And, and Rishi, maybe you can copy those into the chat just to remind people what those topics are, but they, we'll, we've got them on the mural board, which I'll pull up right now. Um, and and it'll, it'll be there. If you just need us to navigate to a particular part of the, of the board, we can do that. If you need a reminder of what those elements are, we've got them off to the, the side here um, and, and can uh, navigate to any one of them. And CJ is going to help draw and, and help us understand what your thoughts and ideas are. So that's a lot. Uh, who, who wants to go first and talk about the emerging design elements, whether it's interface to the street or the use of open space. Uh, there were a lot of comments about building shape and respect for the neighbors. So Scott, you've, you've got the quick hand up. Let, let's, let's go with you first. So um, one of the things that um, I've seen over the years is that the city is really good at putting things in place, but really bad at enforcing them, okay? So for example, the city will plant street trees but we'll not, we'll watch them all die, okay? So there's, there's no enforcement mechanism for a project like this. So the developer can come along, can build a project like this. The trees all go in and they look really nice. And two years later, they're all dead, okay? And there's no enforcement from the city. The city will do nothing to actually go back to the de development and say, you've got to have these trees, okay? So um, that's one of the issues. Another issue I have is that you've, you've got a nice um, setback in the front, but there, uh, there's a street in between the front and um, the street and the buildings across the, the street, as well as trees. There's not a whole lot of setbacks on the side, although I see a little on one side. And there's probably no setback in the back. And so what you've done is you've made it look nice from the street, but you haven't really made it look nice from all four sides. Okay. So those are our issues that all need to be 
um, addressed as part of this. And another thing is balconies are nice, except when that balcony looks down upon somebody else's backyard or down into somebody else's house. And so those are also issues that, that need to be addressed. And I really don't see any open space in this development that you've showed right here, except maybe that eight to 10 feet between the front of the building and the street. Um, you've got open space balconies for particular units, but you don't really have anything. You, you don't have a you, you don't have a place where um, on that property somebody could sit down um, and and you know have a picnic or where they walk up six flights or, of yeah. Um, so there's there the, it. it what you consider open space, other people really wouldn't consider open space. They consider it a balcony. So more common open space on a on a property that everybody can enjoy, not just balconies like you uh, or or decks that you're seeing on this exhibit here. Maybe a little pocket park in between this building and the single family home. Good. Thank you, Scott. Let's see. We had. Debbie with her hand up, I think, um, but it, it came back down. There you are, Debbie. Go ahead, please. One thing Debbie that's- Debbie Baldacci, so, great. Yes, thank you. One thing that's so important um, is the noise element. And at the recent meeting and planning on Monday night, they decided not to propose the same noise requirement for decks and balconies, which is 65 decibels that they use for common space. And so you're gonna have like, for example, on Alameda, many, many roof decks, 87, some of them are 1500 square feet. So if you have a complaint in these high density developments because they're having a party on the roof deck or whatever, law enforcement won't be able to enforce anything if the noise ordinance doesn't apply to roofs and balconies. So how can we address that in this plan so that there's a mechanism to enforce noise that will be generated by many people in a concentrated area? Thank you, Debbie. That's very specific and a very, very, very good question and, and concern. Okay, we've got a lot of other topics. I'm gonna, I'm gonna point to one after we have Daniel. Daniel, you're up. Daniel Z. I just wanted to, uh, you know, one, support the, the notion of pocket parks. I assume that for, for uh, any specific development, you know, maybe you could have a pocket park or some just small, small outdoor common space that folks can go to to get away. You think of the pandemic uh, and anyone who might be stuck in an apartment wants to get outside, you want an area that is nearby to do that. I think any, every neighborhood uh, probably needs something to that effect. Um, separately, uh, you know, wide sidewalks in the image that we're staring at right now, you have this, you have the sidewalks and then you have this great street barrier, or I'm sorry, the tree barrier. Um, that's great. Uh, I have two kids who are listening right now. And <laughs> That makes me feel more comfortable with them walking down the streets. I can tell you going down St. Carlos Avenue and them walking to school, um, it is a long walk for them. And I, there's still, there are a lot of improvements have been made, but it is still, I'm not com fully comfortable with them doing that, nor am I comfortable with myself. Um, and I, as I get older, I want to make sure I feel comfortable uh, doing that. So uh, there's that. Uh, last point is just, uh, in the neighborhood I live in, in East San Carlos, you know, I think one of the things that is really nice is we face, uh, there's actually fewer garages and it forces us to go outside to our cars. Um, so uh, this, it really kind of makes us face the street um, and it actually forces us to engage with neighbors, which I think makes it a nice community. Um, I like at least the building that we see here that it, there's a lot facing the street. Um, I think doing that actually enhances the neighborhood uh, or neighborhoods a lot. Um, I think more of that in, in other places, as opposed to a lot of new designs have garages in the back um, and people 
bring their cars in and they go into their garage and leave. And it actually reduces interactions with, with others. Um, so finding ways to kind of bring people, uh, I think to one another, I think actually enhances the neighborhood and actually forces people outside to use those sidewalks. So the, this zone that we're showing here, uh, Daniel, that brings people out to the, to the sidewalk. Yeah, I mean, I think that's part of it. Uh, I think obviously having cars on this, on people having parking on the street, that, that is part of it too. Okay, great, thank you. Mark, you're next. A little bit of a broken record here, but in this uh, depiction of these elements, I don't see the bike infrastructure. I think to myself, where am I gonna be riding? I don't see where I'm gonna ride. <clears throat> I don't see a place that I would park if I'm visiting some friends in this building or these buildings. Um, I don't see where I would charge if I had an electric something or other. And I don't see any place that I would sit down back to the kind of the, the parklet idea. Uh, if I parked my, my bike, if I, there was a place to park uh, safely and lock it up, um, where would I sit and chat with my neighbors? There's, there's sort of not that pedestrian bike ethos here anywhere uh, depicted. We forgot to put people in the pictures, <laughs> Mark. And it, it's not just the people. It's the it's the street furniture. It's the place to sit down and have a bite to eat with with somebody or have a chat. Um, you know, enjoy the sunshine outside. This is very antiseptic from that perspective. Uh, so, uh, joking aside, really, there should be uh, some way to invite humans to sit, socialize, uh, and, and visit their neighbors, literally, with uh, being able to park, charge, and, and navigate their bicycle around. We got the street for the car. That's nice, but that's, that's not how we're going to be moving around in the future. Great. Thank you. Oh, I don't see any other hands up, but what I wanted, oh, there we go. Amy, you had your hand up a minute ago, and I see it again. Please. Amy, you're on. You probably need to unmute your. Sorry, you that's okay. <laughs> Sorry, I was fussing with it. Um, I just would like to kind of um, piggyback on what Debbie had mentioned about um, the rooftop decks. You know, there is you know, currently being reviewed a design that's going to have rooftop decks. That these rooftop decks are going to be large and are encompassing the whole top of the building of the townhouses. So it's essentially like a third floor or fourth floor in this case. And the noise that that will create um, will be just unfortunate and will take away from the enjoyment of the neighborhood around and actually all the neighbors in general living within that um, complex as well. And that's a real concern. I think there's a difference between a balcony and a huge rooftop deck. Thanks, Amy. All right. Is anybody that wants to talk about colors or this particular issue? And I think this is the, the transition to the adjacent lower scale neighborhoods. A uh, couple, couple of you have raised this as something that clearly needs to be addressed as part of objective design standards. And um, I see that Scott has a comment. Let me give a sec here to see if there's someone who hasn't had a chance yet that wants to, to address the issue of transition or, or something else. Not yet. Okay, Scott, you're on. So when I was a planning commissioner for the city of San Carlos, we did away with the idea that the city or anybody on the planning commission or the design review committee um, could tell you what color your house can be. So I'm not sure, I know my wife mentioned it and my neighbor mentioned that um, they were told what color their house could be, but technically the city of San Carlos does not have that ability anymore. As part of the general plan update that occurred 10 years ago or more, um, you are not allowed to tell anybody what color their project can be. So that's one thing to think about. Um, I see the articulation or the, uh, the scaling uh, away from the single family home, um, 
that's on the the um, the map right now, the uh, on the image right now, that's better. Um, I I think the the problem with that is that what you've done is you, it looks like you've put the balconies out there. So now you've got a whole group of people who are just there looking down upon the, the house that's next door. And so I'm not sure that's your solution. Um, that was a solution that came up at four, 405 um, Industrial and was probably the most insensitive design building that I've ever seen um, facing the East San Carlos neighborhood because they now have a balcony that sits 90 feet in the air and looks down into the neighborhood where they're going to have celebrations and, and, and things like that. So I think, yes, stepping away from the single family home is good, um, but you also have to understand that no matter how much you step away, as you continue to go taller, you're still looking down upon the the home that's next door. So there has to be some limitation on how tall that gets, um, or you need to put in really, really big trees, okay? Um, and one example is um, the Alexandria building that was down, um, that's down on Industrial Road, promised the neighborhood that they were going to put really tall build uh, trees next to their building so that the neighborhood would never see their building. Well, what they actually put in were eight foot trees. And so those trees will never grow to be more than 25 feet. And that creates a problem for projects that come along and say, we're going to put lots of trees in. And the reality is nobody believes that they're going to put trees in. And there's no way that anybody um, enforces those trees. And so that's one of the issues that occurs here. And I'll stop talking. <laughs> Thank you, Scott. OK, we've got Debbie and Daniel lined up. So we Debbie, I see. I see two hands for you. <laughs> okay. Oh, this wait, no, just one. Okay, there we got Debbie, Mark, and, and then Daniel. Yes, on the transition to adjoining, I agree with Scott who mentioned that building on 405 Industrial. So one of the things they did over there, a couple of things they did that may help would be they had a certain kind of glazing on the windows that so that birds wouldn't fly into it. And they had automatically luring um, blinds. So sometimes I will phrase things in the terms of protecting the environment where, because that'll get more protection than actual people living in the area. So perhaps there would be a way that you could have glazing on the windows that darken the light at night or blinds that automatically lower to prevent light pollution. Uh, the Sierra Club has been very good about uh, publicizing the dark skies kind of ordinances where you try to prevent decks and balconies from having the kind of lighting that's gonna to add to that. So glazing, automatically lowering blinds, light that's directed downward, those kind of things to make less of an impact on the uh, single family neighborhoods or the apartments or townhomes or other businesses nearby. Thank you. Thanks, Debbie. Mark B. Yeah, I think under materials is probably the right place for this one, uh, materials and colors maybe. Um, setting a reflectivity standard. So you take Google Earth and, and um, uh, measure the reflectivity so it could be an objective standard, but there's lots of ways to achieve reducing heat island impacts in using this picture as an example. So having more green material on roof and sides, uh, color can make an impact, uh, reducing amount of roof space, uh, the type of material so it's not lots of black uh, tiles or black asphalt uh, will make a measurable difference in how hot it feels on hot days outside. So I encourage um, using reflectivity as a tool to make it a more livable, uh, comfortable environment. 
Good, thanks. I appreciate the, the detail there. As promised, you guys are getting into the detail. That's exactly what we're looking for. Uh, Daniel. Hi, so I wanted to go back to the whole notion of transitions and just support the, the fact that, you know, neighborhoods have a, a, a style or character, or a, a, a current nature to them. And I think change is good, but it need, there needs to be just, and this is a general comment, comment, but just we need to take into account that they should transition to whatever this next phase is. Um, and so step backs, trees, uh, and, and the like, it, it, I think it's just super critical to making those transitions successful. Good. Thanks, Daniel. Uh, Patty Marsters. Hello. So can you hear me now? So I was there at that meeting about 405 industrial and it was like they got feedback that it's too close to the neighborhood. So they said, well, we'll lower the height of the building and we'll have a terrace. And a terrace is just a room without walls to me. So they kind of said, we'll lower the height, but then they put back the height. So I think what you need to draw on this picture is the um, first terrace needs to be some kind of roof. And then the second terrace needs to be down one floor. And it needs to have perhaps some kind of glazing so people don't fall off when they're drunk or whatever. And so that glazing is, is stopping the light from going into the rest of the neighborhood. Cause it's not just that one house that's going to be affected by a party on that deck. It's the whole neighborhood around there. It's all gonna be reflected because what I notice is you got a lot of back and forth in and out um detail on the street side and i guess that cuts down on reflective noise from cars and trucks and motorcycles that go by but it's completely flat and it, on the on the right side and it looks like it's completely flat on the left side that is going to spread the noise all the way to the left of that screen so I would say it needs to be lower and they need to have some kind of fence or trellis or, you know, the, the landscape, the landscaping needs to be up there, not down next to the, not only next to the single family homes. And I hope that my um, chat comments uh, got picked up. I don't I think, have to repeat them if they did. Yeah, I think Rish, Rishi's pulling things out of the chat and you, you might not see them actually going, going up on the board. They might be gone on another portion of the board. So yes, we're, we, we, well, she's talking. we, we yeah, welcome oh, and, and uh, thank you. are capturing all the chats. Great. Would anyone like to talk about entrances or balconies? We've talked a little bit about that and we've, we've got some some comments down. Uh, we've talked about balconies in terms of open space and keep, keeping them from uh, Im impacting neighborhoods. But what, what about the thought of the, how does a, a uh, the building relate to the front to the and, and bring people in? I think it's something that, that Mark had mentioned is the importance of, of bringing people out onto the street and, and creating that neighborliness. Scott, you wanna comment on that? Sure. I think balconies on the front are much better than balconies on the side, which face the other buildings, or in the back, which face other buildings. I think balconies on the front are are more welcoming and more um, uh, more street facing, um, where you know you could you could be out there, you could talk to somebody. Um, I think the other thing is if you're going to have balconies 
on any of the other sides, that they need to be landscaped in such a way that it provides privacy for the people who live on the balcony, as well as privacy to the neighboring buildings um, of whatever sort are going to be there. And I know it can be done, but again, once again, there, the, there's an enforcement piece here that if you do that and then the person kills all the plants, then how do you enforce all of these things? And you know, that's that's one thing that um, you know is is really troublesome about the way the the things are done today. Thank you, Scott. Debbie, you have a, a comment or question about entrances or balconies? Yes, thank you. I just wanted to agree with Scott and others who've talked about how balconies on the front of the building create a welcoming facade and eliminating or minimizing balconies on the side and the back can go a long way toward protecting privacy for the new people that we welcome into San Carlos in those units but provide visual privacy for the surrounding lower neighborhoods. So front balconies, they, they should be designed in a way, like he said, that has landscaping and also in a way that encourages interaction with the community. And it, the, the way you've got it displayed now, I think that looks very attractive. Thank you. I'll, I'll pass that on to our designer, Debbie. And, and just so folks know, the, these we, we put together just to be um, representative. We threw a lot into each of the into this graphic just so that we could talk about um, the, the different topic areas that we're we're covering tonight. Uh, any other particular topics that somebody would like to touch on? We've had um, a number of speakers with a, a lot of uh, uh, good comments, but. Uh, in, Scott, before we, we uh, go, go to you again, I just wanna make sure that we're giving everybody else a chance. Um, anybody else before? Uh, actually, Scott, if I'm gonna take Gina Vandellos first, if that's okay with you, if I've, and Gina, if I've said your name properly, I hope. And then Scott, we'll come back to you after Gina. Gina, a particular com uh, topic area you'd like to touch on? Hi, I'm really, um... I'm really concerned about these buildings where what they're going to look like behind. Um, I'm a situation where it's very uh, possible that there would be a big building behind my property. And I really wanted to um, make sure that uh, setbacks, um, green zones are uh, between my property and a great big building. And, and it's a little daunting to think about seeing a great big wall behind my property or a bunch of balconies, these type of things I'm really concerned about. And I'd like them, that to be taken into consideration. And so the things that you're not seeing right now here on the back, back, back side, which we don't imagine how that's been designed yet. So th thank you for bringing that up. We'll make sure mm -hmm. we got that down. Okay. Scott. Yeah, so I absolutely agree with Gina that when you design a building like this, you don't just take into consideration what's in front of it, what's on the sides of it. You have to also address what's behind it. And if there's, for example, a single family home behind this building, I would look at it and I would say right from the beginning, it's at least one story too tall. OK, because it doesn't fit in with a single family home next to it. There's a street in between this building and the house next to it. And if there's a single family home behind it, it's too tall. OK, because you now have and I'm a, I'm going to assume this is a four story building and not a five story building and say five that stories. that if it's five stories, then it's two stories too tall. Um, especially for a single family home, what happens if the sun rises um, to my right and sets to my left? The house behind it is not going to have pretty much any sun all day long. And we there are examples in San Carlos where there's a two-story wall on two sides of a single family home, and that backyard 
does not get any sun whatsoever and you cannot grow plants in that backyard. And yeah, well, you can grow mold um, or, or, or algae, um, but that is a problem here um, with the height of this building in relation to single family homes nearby. And so that's, that's something that has to be addressed. And the only reason that three stories would fit is because there's a street between that um, building and the house to the left. Great, thanks for the detail on that, Scott. Gina, you had another comment about this particular issue or was there another uh, item yeah, that you wanted hi, us to address? Hi, th this is Gina's husband, Dimitri. Um, hi, Dimitri. Hi, I, I just wanted to get a little context about, I mean, this is just a building plopped into what looks to be a bunch of different sort of sized um, uh, you know, buildings. It's, it's, I don't know that it's necessarily representative of a specific neighborhood. Um, but our concern on the east side is that we have two um, uh, MUN zones, uh, one that cuts completely through a residential area, and then the other that forms a T on the boundary of it. And uh, special consideration needs to be made for, for these types of um, areas and zones. So it's one thing that just talk about the, the buildings themselves, um, uh, but you know, I, I I'm I'm a little concerned that we're uh, I I also joined this late, but I you know I don't know if there's been any discussion of like middle housing and having duplexes or fourplexes, uh, smaller density units because this seems uh, quite high if it's going to be next to a single family residential. Unit. And Dimitri, just to let you know that um, in, indeed this is something that we've just plopped down so that we can talk about different design elements of multifamily oh. housing, but captured in the multifamily de definition is certainly, as you've defined it, middle income housing, four plexes, I didn't say duplexes, middle income. Plexes. I didn't say middle income. I said. Right, middle, missing middle housing is what it's. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, Thank so th those things that are between a single family home and, and a two to three story apartment. So, uh, so right. indeed, so it, those will be addressed by the objective design standards. Yeah, so it's, it, I mean, it's really about context, right? So uh, um, to me, this is too much of an abstraction. What we, what we ought to be doing is looking at what would be an okay objective design standard uh, uh, given these sets of parameters. So get, given the parameters of uh, immediately adjacent to a single family neighborhood or backyards of single family homes, what would those standards be? Uh, against what would the standards be if buildings are built on El Camino or other sort of commercial corridors uh, where they're not directly impacting uh, single family homes and neighborhoods. So again, it's the context that matters, having a context sensitive solution. Uh, the design of the buildings is, you know, those are aesthetics that we can, we can discuss. Um, but, but without that context, I'm not sure how useful the discussion is at least at least for me that's my observation thank you okay well, and maybe we can get some more detailed comments from you later we, um and and you can have the opportunity to look through the comments that that folks have made but uh and, and see if it needs to be augmented but certainly um co context is critical and important when we're talking about objective design standards other issues comments commenters No. Um, why don't I? S well, actually, what I'll do is I'll just let every everybody see that you know just great comments tonight, everybody on on topics, um, a lot of detail, and this will not be the final opportunity to make comments on anything like this because we will uh, uh, we'll be drafting the objective design standards over the next several months and welcome all opportunities. As I mentioned, there is a uh, a survey that will be coming out. So why don't we, why don't I stop sharing here, Rishi, and have you bring the presentation back up. And we'll have, um, I think we've got Andrea to give us a rundown on, on where we're headed next. And I think actually Ruch is gonna 
kick us off on the next Ah, step. right. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. So, um, hello everyone. I'm Ruta Dande, Associate Planner with the City's Planning Division, uh, giving you um, a little bit of uh, information on uh, where are we headed as next steps uh, for this project. So under the ongoing community engagement, we just completed our stakeholder meetings, met with some of the developer and architects um, who have been working with the city. Um, we received some comments and input from them. Uh, moving on, we would be also meeting with the planning commission and the residential design review committee, who mainly focuses more on the single family uh, developments, uh, the IDRC, which you may know about. Uh, we will be meeting them uh, early December um, as planned uh, into a study session. And then um, during this time, parallelly, um, the MIG team, uh, along with um, input from staff uh, and the city's um, planners here, uh, we would be uh, developing these emergence, uh, emerging uh, design standards or the objective design standards as we are talking about. Um, also, as Laura mentioned a few times during the presentation, um, we will be rolling out um, a community survey in November. So everybody please watch out for that. And we are really looking forward to get some valuable feedback from the community. So as uh, Laura mentioned, this is not the only time that uh, you would uh, get the opportunity to provide any feedback. I think this survey would be a great place uh, to provide your input and comments as well. And then uh, uh, finally, after that, uh, we will be uh, focusing on developing these emerging uh, design standards and uh, hoping to bring it to the community uh, for um, uh, as draft standards for any input um, in the next few months. So this is the plan. And then uh, we have, um, as Andrea had mentioned initially uh, during the presentation, and I would like to repeat again, that we have a web page uh, dedicated on uh, these projects and we um, um, update this quite often based on any uh, new updates. So please, um, if you have, um, if you want to read more about this project, uh, here is the website uh, or the web page dedicated to this project. And then beyond this community workshop and the survey, if you ever have any comments, please feel free to uh, send out your comments to planning at cityofsancarlos.org. We would be, um, looking forward to get um, all the input and feedback that the community can provide for this project. Um, with that, I will uh, pass it on to Laura for any closing comments. And actually, Rucha, sorry, I'm gonna just jump in really quickly. Um, I also wanted to reiterate, and I know this was mentioned throughout, that once these um, emerging standards are developed, they will be coming back to the community um, for comment. So, there'll be another workshop as well as review by the planning commission and city council. So um, at that at that point, you'll be able to see more concrete um, standards uh, to comment and provide input on as well. And we've got two hands up, I, I think, just, just to close if people have any final uh, quick questions before we conclude for the evening. We'll have Debbie and then Gina slash Dimitri um, to, to respond. So Debbie, yes, you have a final question comment? Yes, thank you. I almost forgot to mention this, but what is the notice requirement on neighborhood courtesy notification? Because at the uh, meeting on Monday night for the general plan, there was a specific action, which was action uh, land use 9.3, which says consider amending the zoning ordinance to require courtesy notification of nearby residents for any multifamily residential use or commercial use proposed in immediate proximity to a single family residential neighborhood. That was stricken from the requirements. So we're very worried that we won't even have any notification uh, of not only these tall buildings, but of commercial next to single family. So can you please be sure that in the general plan or in this plan, that it includes community notification when these things are gonna be built, even if it's just gonna be ministerial approval that doesn't require public hearing. 
So I would ask Lisa Porres if she's on to comment about that, if possible. Thank you, Lisa. Lisa, did you want to comment on that or, or uh, have a separate conversation with, with Debbie? Uh, What's your thank preference? You. Sorry, Laura. Can everybody hear me? I'm just jumping on real quick. Mm -hmm. um, here I am. Uh, thank you, Debbie, for your comment. And just a point of clarification, um, when the general plan was updated in 2009, this was a particular action item that was set into place to give direction to the city about notification. So if you look at our zoning ordinance today, the zoning ordinance does require new projects um, that go to the planning commission to be noticed within um, all, all uh, property owners within 300 feet of a project are noticed. And more recently, um, the city went ahead and amended its zoning ordinance to expand uh, the notification buffer for single family projects from 150 feet from a new project site to 300. So these are in place today and they're codified. So that old action that um, came about back in 2009, it's just being eliminated because it's no longer necessary. The zoning ordinance already sets forth the notice requirements. So I hope that clears things up. We're not getting rid of any noticing requirements that we have uh, pursuant to our zoning ordinance. And I can send you the section of the zoning ordinance so you can see exactly that language. Thank you. And uh, Gina and then Neil. Yeah, hi, it's Dimitri this time. Um, a yeah, a couple of things about that. Um, I wanna thank Debbie for that comment because it is something that um, for residents in the greater East uh, San Carlos neighborhood that, that we feel uh, many, uh, there, there are many projects that, that do directly impact us, but we do not get the notifications. Um, and I'm curious because we recently received a letter about uh, the uh, zoning changes uh, along East San Carlos Avenue. And it, it, it's, it appeared as if uh, residents on McHugh in Bayport Court weren't notified. Uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm sure McHugh is within 300 feet. I, I would think Bayport Court might be as well. Um, so I'm, I'm not sure how consistent that is. But um, so that's just one point. And but my other is what is the process for ensuring the community input actually gets heard and acted upon because I, what I've heard and what I've also experienced is uh, when we put in our own personal time and you know, it's, it's not always easy for people working full time, uh, raising families, et cetera, to, to go to these meetings, to provide the inputs, um, you know, to see that those inputs are often uh, frankly discarded. Um, uh, uh, so, um, I think we, it would behoove us to look at better uh, feedback mechanisms and review mechanisms to ensure that, uh, uh, you know, when, when something like this occurs and, and we're reviewing it, that the folks who were, you know, providing that input feel that their voices are heard. Because uh, I think almost uh, unilaterally, most folks in our community, uh, at least what I hear, and what I've, uh, what I've experienced is uh, we provide the inputs, uh, but then we don't feel that, that A, they're acted upon and, and those inputs um, are, um, you know, are, are, are heard in the way we would like to. Thanks. Uh, city staff, I don't know if you wanted to provide a quick response to that. Or is that just more of a comment that um, Mitri wants to make sure that folks are are heard when their comments are made? Um, Mitri, I'll, I'll just make a quick comment on that. Well, Le uh, it, in, as unless either Lisa or, or Andrea wants to, is that uh, the, the the public process is one in which everybody's voice is heard. Not everybody gets what they want all the time, but it's a it's the ability for everybody to indicate what their their um, desires are, and then it's. Uh, the, the public process through which decisions are made. Yeah, and I'd like to add as well, I think um, that also outlines what's really important, I believe, about this initiative is that, um, you know, with certain state laws, there are projects that will not go to public hearing. Um, so to your point, 
um, Dimitri, having the feedback and input, this is really truly important at this moment. And as these standards are developed, especially for those projects where um, there isn't an opportunity for public hearing because state law won't allow it. Um, so, so I think that's a very important point. And um, also why I would definitely encourage everyone to, um, you know, as Laura said, bring the message to your neighborhood, get people involved. Um, because this is a really unique opportunity to, to have an influence on what design will look like for both single family and, and multifamily and mixed use. Thanks, Andrea. Neil and then Debbie. Hi, this is Mika Shaw. I live on McHugh Avenue. And so first, I just want to add that I did not receive any notice. Um, so I'm concerned if some people did. My property is definitely within 300 feet of any proposed um, construction that's going to happen. My backyard door opens right on to East San Carlos Avenue. I see every single day all the um, traffic that goes through. We have been active as a um, neighborhood to convey our concerns about congestion, about traffic moving through here. And I didn't notice in the picture earlier a parking lot. And so uh, I wanted to understand how do the objective design standards address parking and parking lots? Because if there is no parking lot included, that is very concerning. I don't understand how the um, so many homes could be considered in this already very congested condensed space in East San Carlos, and there's no plan for parking. So would love to hear further thoughts on that and would love to get the notice that I didn't receive. Thank you. Um, Mika, just a quick response is we're not talking about a particular project this evening, but just generally objective design standards for projects coming forward. I understand. And, and that's why okay. I want to make sure that the design standards include parking as a part of them. Great. And that, that's important. Yes. And the, this prototypical exhibit that we showed that there was a you couldn't see it but there was a driveway that would lead the parking either behind or underneath the building but uh, the park the, the objective design standards are not proposing any adjustments to the city's current parking standards so that's what's in the zoning code today are what the city's parking standards are that would be carried forward um, you, if you were at the beginning part of the meeting, you may have uh, heard that there is a new state law that does uh, restrict the city's ability to impose parking within certain radiuses uh, near transit stations. And so that's something, um, I don't know, Andrea, you came on screen. I don't know if you wanted to say something more about that. But, I, yeah, uh, I, I okay. just wanted to clarify one thing um, about the, the current parking regulations. Um, there is um, some, uh, there are some changes possibly proposed, not as part of this initiative, but as part of the housing element um, changes with regards to parking um, that has not been adopted yet. Um, and that that is a separate process. And you uh, probably heard those who attended Monday night, the planning commission. Um, so I, I just wanted to clarify that the code as today for parking may change. Okay. Um, however, it is not part of this specific initiative on design standards. Well, I'll just and reiterate. Well, I'm a parent. I have three small kids. This is rough for me to be here. I can't make all the meetings, but I'll reiterate that I believe it's very important. And irrespective of what, what state law is, I have elected city officials to represent me. You will be hearing from me and the community, even if you want to, you know, bounce it around. But this this is very concerning. There are more than 25 kids on McHugh Avenue alone. And that's not, you know, if you multiply that by all the other streets here. And so that's where e all of these community meetings, I've taken the time to be here. I appreciate that you are all here. It's late in your evenings too, but I don't want it to be just brushed aside. I would rather that it's included and you can say, okay, look, there's a driveway, it's here, whatnot. But um, this is a concern and we as a community need to hear how it's being addressed. Um, so please don't brush us off. And I'm actually glad you you said that and clarified it because I, I think I misspoke. So I was when I'm talking about the parking standards, I was talking about the number of required spaces, not necessarily things like driveway design, um, like you were speaking about. So thank you for- Well, the number of spaces matters too, because if you have a driveway and there's only five spots, it's really 
pointless. No, I agree. I just, I, I wanted to clarify because you're right. There, it, there's a whole, there's a whole host of things related to parking. Um, yeah. And so I think we, that could be yeah. put into the design piece. And actually, because the an important point that you bring up is uh, that the placement of driveways on a property is all part of the site design process that the objective design standards will address. So good site planning that ensures that driveway widths are adequate and they're placed so driveways aren't obscured and um, are protective of pedestrians. So that, that's something certainly the objective design standards can look at is the relationship of a driveway and parking areas to the overall design yeah. of the site. And also, you know, places for whether you can make a right turn or a left turn. We had a long conversation about this. Some places on Industrial Avenue, it's really difficult to make those turns. Um, places for, you know, we have a lot of delivery trucks. Where can they pull up and pause to do their deliveries? East San Carlos Avenue in particular is very narrow. So if you have so many homes that are going to be there, you know, units, a lot of deliveries, uh, you should anticipate there's going to be a lot of pulling up, dropping off. And so where is that going to happen? And those, those I believe, do uh, make sense to then incorporate within your objective design standards. And, and you you guys can't see it, I can, but uh, CJ and, and Rishi are furiously writing all these things down on the, on the mirror board and they're being captured. So th these comments are not being lost just because you can't see them. Um, Let's see, we were at about quarter to, to eight this evening. We want to wrap up a little bit before eight. So we'll have Debbie and then Scott and then Patty and see if anybody wants to, to wrap up with any closing comments. Debbie? Yes, for all the people that are listening, this is one of the most important things we can do because it's my understanding, and please, Lisa or Andrea, correct me if I'm wrong, but if these big developments are according to code, like if they have 100 units and then they comply with the design standards, isn't it true that that will be ministerial approval and it won't go to planning or city council? So if we don't get our input in on where balconies should be located, the size of windows, transitional standards, if we don't speak up now and get that incorporated into the objective design standards, is it true that there will be no public hearings on these big complexes or on anything built on under Senate Bill 9 and Senate Bill 10. Andrea or Lisa? Sure, let's see. Okay, there we go. Um, so thank you, Debbie. Uh, so it is true that for the laws that um, that that you mentioned, there's also some other ones that if a proposal meets these objective standards that are developed, that they require ministerial approval. It is not every multifamily or mixed use project, um, but we also you know, anticipate the, the laws that are coming um, are getting, are trending more towards this, this objective design standard language. Um, so under the current laws, and Laura showed a few in the beginning um, on the slides, if a project meets those those standards that are that are adopted and fall under one of those thresholds, then it's correct. It, it, it cannot be taken to public hearing under state law. That does not mean every single project, but but there will be some. And I, and I also want to reiterate, because I know we've been talking about um, some commercial properties too, um, which is helpful in terms of, of developing the standards um, when we're talking about, you know, things like um, balconies and placement. But I did want to just reiterate that the objective standards here are for residential only. So they, they won't be applying to, for example, a life science building or something like that, um, this particular set of standards. So I hope that answered your question, Debbie. And, and Debbie, I appreciate you emphasizing that this is the perfect time for people to weigh in, that this is exactly what we're looking for because these standards need to reflect the community vision values and what is important to preserve the character of your neighborhoods. Scott? So uh, I'm gonna go back to parking for a second. And hypothetically, if a project went in on East San Carlos Avenue and they are not required to have parking, then, and they don't put parking in, and there's a parking permit program in place all around them, they won't have any place to park. 
And so is there anything in the standards the way they are right now that would allow them to get around our existing permit parking program? And Scott, just to just to clarify, you're talking about the not these objective design standards, but the the code now, right? Um, e either way. So if you look at say uh, SB 10, mm -hmm. it's not going to allow. It's going to essentially say that you don't have to build any parking because you're within half a mile of of the Caltrain station. Yet we've got a parking permit program in place that will prevent people from parking in the neighborhood. And, and so if a building builds something with no parking, they're not going to have any parking and they're going to have to be a transit only development. And I think, you know, you saying that Scott also brought up to me, you know, in speaking with developers, um, they're also going to want to develop to what makes sense for them, right? And so they're, in my discussions, at least with some of them, you know, yes, maybe there's the idea of having reduced parking, but they might not necessarily want no parking just for the, you know, rentability or sellability of a unit too. So um, in terms of your specific question about the parking permit program, I don't want to misspeak on it. Um, my my understanding is is as you said you need the permit to park in the neighborhood um but we can definitely look into that and get you a, a clearer response that i can make sure is accurate for you as well thank you yeah of course patty we're gonna ha have you say the last words tonight before we close out sorry batteries dying okay parking um, so what I'm hearing from some of the city council people is that we need this transit oriented development so that, and that means big buildings near our single family homes to me and on El Camino. And we need it to keep our, our teachers, our, our firefighters, our nurses, all these people in the city. So that is like just such false reasoning because what teacher is going to take transit to Heather? What firefighter is going to take transit to Howard to their firehouse? They're going to need cars. So, so the housing that you put on El Camino and on in our neighborhood, the trans, they're going to be taking transit out of the city, which is fine. That's a that's probably a boon. But my question, so I guess I just want to point out the uh, hypocrisy of that idea. And my question is, those multi-family uh, complexes up on Crestview, if somebody wants to redevelop them and put in you know, with like a, a uh, what do you call it? To put in affordable housing, if they get enough affordable housing, how, how do, does the density that's allowed there go out the window also? And it seems to me that um, they need more density there. They need those buildings redone for fire safety, for, um, you know, the landscaping needs to be rethought out and it, with new buildings, they could get the housing and safer housing so that uh, we're all safer. Um, I think that's it. Thank you, Patty. And thank you everyone for attending this evening. We encourage you all to stay engaged and let your neighbors know let, let your entire neighborhood know that this project is, is uh, out there and, and is really welcoming for public input. Um, Andrea or Lisa or Rucha or Megan, did you want to have any closing words other than good night? And thank I you. Just, I just wanted to say thank you again to everyone and reiterate um, for the 10th time is that this, this is the time to, to provide input over these next few months. We really um, encourage and want the public input and engagement um, and as uh, Debbie mentioned, 
uh, it, it is important. And, and I think it will be, you know, something that's reflected in, in future development within the city. So um, please spread the word to your neighbors. There'll be ample opportunities still to comment um, and also look at the actual standards once they're developed. Um, and please reach out even, you know, outside of the, the workshops. Um, we had the, the email and website on the screen and, and we're definitely collecting um, all of the all of the comments uh, and, and trying to incorporate everything as well. So thank you again, everyone.